Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And speaking of transformation, there are people, very few people like Richard Dasher, who have seen it from various different uh, viewpoints. As an American, as an expat, as a professor, as a musician, and many different roles. So Richard, tell us a little bit about you and all your adventures before we get started. Shankar, thank you very much for your introducing me that way. Uh, I really appreciate your interest in many different aspects of what I've been able to see during my life. So I am now the director of the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford. And in that capacity, I'm on the adjunct faculty of Stanford. So I teach, I do research. I uh, bring in the resources that keep our center going. My arrangement is basically, as long as I bring in the money, I can work here. Uh, and I've been doing this for 30 years, but it's been a very interesting path to get here. I could never claim to have planned my career. So I started out when I was in high school being really interested in science, being really pretty geeky and wanting to um, study applied physics and mathematics. And then in the middle of my senior year, I had kind of maybe my first young life crisis. I decided that I wanted to try something that I was good at and interested in but had no idea whether I could be successful or not. I grew up in South Georgia, a relatively small town of about 50,000 people. And I decided I wanted to be a classical musician. So I double majored in university in German studies and music. I went to Georgia State University in Atlanta because I was able to study with the principal clarinetist of the Atlanta Symphony, who was one of the big names in clarinet playing at the time. And he moved to San Francisco in my second year. And so I followed him out to San Francisco and got my undergraduate degree from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. So uh, I tried doing graduate studies in music, hit a brick wall that's called faculty politics in another university, and decided that, okay, music is something I'll always love, but it's not what I want to do my career in. So I looked around, was able to talk to the chair of the linguistics department at Stanford, and she looked at my resume and said, okay, we've got an introduction to linguistics course this summer. Why don't you try it? So I tried it. And at the end of the quarter, they put me into the master's program. And I put myself into the competition for the PhD. And within a few months, they gave me a full fellowship to pursue the PhD in linguistics at Stanford. So in the process of studying linguistics, at the time, the department required each PhD student to study a non-European language enough that you could write a paper about that language. And so I started studying Japanese and got more and more interested in the language. At the same time as my own kind of linguistic interests moved into the study of semantics, meaning, and especially how meanings change over time. And so Japanese had absolutely no historical relationship to English or German or any other European language. And if you found similar patterns in a language like Japanese that you did in a language like English or German or whatever, then you knew you were talking about something that's kind of human basic human psychology or human society or human communications. And so that's kind of my focus for the PhD. I then had my next young life crisis, which was deciding that I didn't want to be a college professor. I turned down an offer for a major university in the United States to become an assistant professor of Japanese linguistics 
and instead went to work for the U.S. State Department. I joined the Foreign Service Institute as the supervisor in charge of the Japan and Korea training for American diplomats. So I spent one year in Washington, and there was a vacuum above my head. So uh, I was promoted to be the director of the field schools for Japan and Korea. And so I became a diplomat. I was attached to the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. I was in charge of a small kind of program for full-time training in Yokohama. And I also had regional responsibility for Seoul. So um, I moved to Japan and did that job for four years. And I think it went pretty well. But the only thing I could do after that would be to go back to Washington and take charge of, you know, all Africa, Asia or something like that and become a generalist get further and further away from the language that I had spent so much time studying. So instead, I left the government and went to the private sector. I looked around for companies for several months and eventually wound up doing international rights licensing for a couple of small companies in, guess what, the music business. So things come back, right? So I did that for three years or so. I uh, was, you know, successful, but it was getting time to come home and it was the end of the bubble bursting in Japan. So business was not great. And a friend of mine said, hey, Richard, they're looking for somebody back at Stanford who could teach about Japanese business and who would teach scientific and technical Japanese language. So I thought about it. I talked to some people in science and engineering community and asked what they needed and wrote a couple of course proposals. Stanford bought it, and that was 30 years ago, and I've been back here, and this seems to be the place where I really fit. So we started with the center at uh, with a U.S. Air Force grant, actually, to help the U.S. science and engineering community be better at understanding how to do business in Japan and following, you know, Japanese develops in sci- developments in science and technology. That was um, a big deal in the early 1990s. So uh, I started on this grant and gradually saw changes that were going to happen. And realized that with the development of the internet, you can get information directly from the source really easily. So it's not the information that matters. What matters is being able to understand what the information means. What are the patterns behind the information? So gradually shifted the focus of this technology management center to uh, management of technology and innovation. So innovation became the main thing that we do. And interestingly enough, I found that the kind of approach to research I had done back in linguistics fit perfectly to the kind of problems I'm looking at now. Word meanings change in a language because people are innovative and clever in new phrases that they come up with all the time. Think of all the new slang and new vocabulary that comes up all the time. The process of what happens when a new use of a word appears to all the other related words in the language is very similar to what happens when somebody comes up with a business innovation, a new technology or a new business model. How does that impact all the rest of the industry? So that became an area that I did research into directly. Along with that, management of innovation obviously is a huge problem. So I've been studying management of innovation. And the other thing is looking at different regions. Different regions have different dynamics. Not every place is like Silicon Valley, and it shouldn't try to be like Silicon Valley. Instead, if you do an objective analysis of the flow of people, 
the flow of capital and the flow of knowledge from different institutions in a region, you can understand much better how innovation happens. And you can generally see whatever bottlenecks there are in that region without just assuming that every place should be like Silicon Valley. So that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Uh, one last postscript, all of our uh, funding at the center is from the industry sector now. We don't have any government money. For the last 20 years, we've really been doing projects that companies are interested in. And we are now a membership center so that we have 16 member companies and most of all of our expenses and our programs and my salary as well as the salary of our staff really come from the annual fees that our member companies pay. So thank you very much to our 16 member companies. Wow, wow, I had no idea and I had no idea you were a Japanese scholar. I should have introduced myself as Hajime Maste. Hajime Maste. Well, I learned, I've only been to Japan one time, but it was a very, very interesting and impressive culture. And having lived in various parts of the world, the cultural nuances actually far outweigh technological changes in some ways. You've been involved in technology and at the same time, diverse cultures. Uh, how do you see the changes that are happening in the world today affecting the world? You've seen many generations of technologies from uh, the PC times to the internet, e-commerce, and now AI. Do you think the yeah. world is moving in a fairly similar fashion or has it changed things in differentially in different ways? I think the best way to explain the big picture is that we are in the middle of at least one industrial revolution. Depending on how you count industrial revolutions, we you can say we're in the middle of revolution number three and number four. The World Economic Forum says that the first inter industrial revolution was mechanization in the late 18th century through the mid 19th century. The second industrial revolution was new ways to use machines. That's where you get assembly line, manufacturing, standardized parts, and um, also shift in power sources, right? From steam power to electric power happen too. But really new ways of using machines. So the third revolution, I think, was the spread of digital technology, which really started after the invention of the transistor in 1957. Uh, it would have never taken off if we hadn't had that basic kind of new technology. Uh, the fourth revolution then in this kind of pattern is new ways of using digital technology. So this is where you get all these new tools like artificial intelligence. It's where you get cloud computing. It's where you get edge computing. All of these are new tools. But just like the industrial revolution 150 years ago, People have new tools, and it's absolutely critical for companies to be able to use the new tools to stay competitive and keep growing. And it's absolutely essential for people to learn how to use, use the new tools so that they can be as successful as possible. But people are still people. And the distinctive thing about the current situation is that you have real-time communication that's possible. You have so many more ways of collaborating, sharing data. And so international business used to be about sending oranges from one country to another. Now it's about being in a joint team with people who may be anywhere. And the data may be stored in yet a third country. So um, I think that this real-time communications puts more pressure on the natural cultural differences that we should celebrate. We don't need to throw away our base cultures, but we need to be able to rise above them and work with people in other cultures 
real time for common good. And that requires a bigger kind of consciousness than people are expecting. It's a hard challenge. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, what I find fascinating about many of the programs I've seen and been a part of at the US Asia Technology Management Center is that they are not only about technology. I've attended conscious capitalism sessions, the role of compassion in business, I've attended uh, partnerships between different cultures. Can you tell me a little bit about how much these softer skills or these uh, social skills are important in doing business when you go and uh, cross cross border or different cultures? They will all always be absolutely critical. The biggest challenge with dealing with another culture is you have an incomplete data set. You don't know as much about the other culture as you know about your own. So one danger is that you assume that everything that works in your own culture, of, of course, applies somewhere else. Or you make the assumption that you can't possibly cooperate unless you know more. Both of those are mistakes. But we have to um, assume that people are working in a system where they're trying their best to get by, to do their own best. Um, and it's really nice to work toward a common goal together because that's when you really see that in this rich you know, background of many cultures, we're all trying to ha solve some common problems. For instance, big problems like climate change or you know, just medium-sized problems like how to have a more efficient supply chain or, you know, even small problems like how to uh, make a particular region do more effective economic integration into the world. You bring up some very interesting themes, uh, Professor Dasher, and you have actually worked across different political systems and economic systems, whether it's uh, communist countries or socialist countries or capitalist countries. There's always some geopolitical tension, and we are seeing some right now. How can we reconcile these things? Because each system thinks that they are the best. So how do we make things work? Yeah, I'm actually kind of concerned, um, not just about the competition between the Eastern Bloc, you know, the China-Russia Bloc, and everybody else, or however many blocks there will be, but uh, if you look at this last industrial revolutions 150 years ago, you had horrible, worse conditions of life that were written about by authors like Charles Dickens in the United States, Sinclair Lewis. People who worked in factories were oppressed. And what happened as a result of that is you had new political movements Communism came directly out of the proletarians rising up because they were oppressed. Um, you had fascism come from the same kind of thing. It was a different solution to a social change problem. But in recent years, how much reactionary movement have we seen across the world? This is not just in one country. And I'm not trying to be critical of any particular country. It's a natural thing for a population in the middle of change to have some people who understand the change and want to benefit from it, some people who think they can avoid the change and are very reactionary against it, and then everybody in the middle just trying to get by. So the reactionary groups have taken a lot of political power in a number of different countries, and the relatively centrist political parties are playing more to the people at both ends, whether it's left side or right side. I'm actually quite concerned about this uh, because I think the only solution is not to be selfish. If you're only looking out for your own success, you may have a short temporary success in your lifetime. 
but you're destroying the world for our children and grandchildren in the process. We must be more inclusive in the way that we are trying to spread the benefits of innovation across the population. You see new co new companies that are now the huge guerrilla companies. In the first industrial revolution, it was the oil, oil companies. In this industrial revolution, okay, the giant IT companies. Uh, you see uh, some incredible wealth and people who become incredible sort of public figures just because they had a company that made a lot of money. And you saw the same thing in Germany in the mid-1800s. So what we're seeing is not a new phenomenon. And if we don't want to have world wars and bad things happen, we really have to make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes this time. So I think it is absolutely critical not to just look at your own self-interests as you're building your company, but at what are the ways you can intrinsically bring in benefit to broader segments of the population. We have a number of tools. You know, companies can do corporate social responsibility, but notice that that is post-profit. You make your profit first, and then you figure out what nice philanthropy to do. And I certainly think that, you know, very wealthy people who have used their wealth wisely through philanthropy, I respect that a great deal. But philanthropy is not nearly as good as involving people in a positive way in the change. So uh, governments haven't really figured out the right kind of regulations to do this. And of course, the shareholders of companies in the case of the United States, they have people's retirement funds that they are managing. So, of course, they want to maximize profit, too. But it's a very dangerous kind of situation if we don't all become more conscious of the need for greater good. The U.S. Uh, Asia Technology Management Center has been around for quite a while. What would you consider was the greatest achievement or greatest contribution you made to business as well as to diplomacy around the world? It's easier for me to speak for myself than it is to speak for our center. Yeah. Uh, I think that the thing I'm the most proud of are the young people that I've been privileged to work with and maybe have an influence in their careers and see them go out and be successful. If you want to know why I'm so happy to be back at a university when I didn't want to be a college professor, that's it. It's seeing young people and trying to have a positive impact on them. I have been involved in a number of major transformational um, efforts, largely in Japan, but also in Canada and in some other countries, to improve the kind of higher education landscape. And I think that... Um, Two of the specific institutions I worked on in Japan deserve mention. In uh, 2001 to 2003, I was on the first planning committee for a new university in Japan that later became known as the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, OIST. And it's breaking the mold. It's different from every other university in Japan. It's international, they, it's very small. It's kind of a Caltech model. And, um, you know, I think that of the hundred or so students who are there now, and it will grow to three or 400, uh, I think they represent something like 30 or 40 different countries. So that international model of people coming together to solve common problems in science and technology is something I'm very proud of. Similarly, I've been on the program committee of a major grant funding program in Japan called the World Premier International Research Center Initiative, the WPI program. 
and they provide very large research excellence grants to strong areas in Japanese universities and other research institutions to help them internationalize as well as to catapult them to the top levels of science. And those are having a major impact worldwide. You're seeing these centers now in the top 10 centers uh, in terms of not only number of publications, but top 1% papers that are coming out of the centers. And they have typically about 38 to 40% of the research personnel are from foreign countries. That's very unusual in Japan. I have been in a similar program in Canada, the Canada Excellence Research Chairs, and they've done a really good job. It's great to see this kind of impact on the university side. On the company side, I've worked with an awful lot of companies to try to improve their capacity for dealing with open innovation, relationships with startup companies. And I think that um, some of that seems to be working. So uh, yeah, it's been my privilege, but by far it's the people. The most rewarding part is to be able to meet lots of people from different backgrounds and work with lots of people. We just started our India initiative a year ago with the Institute for Competitiveness in India. And we're delighted that we did a major conference this spring in actually February of 2023. This will be an annual conference now. And I'm very excited about the kind of impact that we can have in building up U.S.-India relations, um, especially in regard to innovation. Switching gears, since you mentioned about young people and education, uh, there's always this ongoing debate about skills education and technology, STEM education versus liberal arts and understanding the bigger picture. Have you leaned one way or the other? And, and if so, why? So, this is something that's very difficult in a developing economy of course you want people with the practical skills to grow the economy as quickly as possible and so that's natural but you need the understanding of humanity that comes from the humanities uh studying music did wonderful things for my background not only in terms of understanding uh, some things about how people with very large egos work, the prima donnas, but uh, also, you know, that's a very core part of what it is to be a human being. And I think we need people to have those specializations, but what we really need is we need greater awareness across fields. So the people who are in music need to understand some business. The people who are in technology really need to understand ethics, not because they took a course in ethics, but because they've taken courses in human society and human psychology, and they can understand it on a deeper level. The thing that will always distinguish us from artificial intelligence is moral reasoning. And without being human, I think that an understanding of morality is kind of not possible, no matter how good the algorithms get to be. Um, and we need to use that. And I think our education programs need to prepare young people for the new world. But part of that new world is for each person to find their path and have the maximum possibility for success in the path that best matches their particular skills and personality. Uh, why are there music schools? Not everyone can be a great, you know, world-class musician. For the students who have that potential, the music school can catapult them into that. But for the other students in that school, it gives them an experience 
like it did for me, that will enrich their lives forever. Now, of course, there's an opportunity cost. And I was able to go into other areas after I did music. But uh, I think that we need all of the fields, but we need greater communication across fields, between fields. I'm especially concerned that, um, you know, if you're studying science and technology, the challenge of getting from the beginning level course all the way to the frontier of knowledge, that distance keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so the curricula really are, are challenged in engineering schools and other departments and universities. But in the process, we cannot forget that this should all be for the service of improving the conditions of people. Indeed, indeed. In fact, you mentioned something earlier, Richard, about the role of innovation. Innovation is not just technological, but it has social impact and leads to social change. What kind of changes do you anticipate will come out of this whole AI, machine learning, generation capabilities that is going on? It's quite different from the other industrial revolutions we've seen earlier, isn't it? Well, I think that it's a major new type of tool. So this is a major new tool, just like electric power was a major new power source. So yes, it will have a big impact on things. I think that um, AI, especially as it gets better and better, will remove a lot of the drudge work, drudgery work but it will require skills in being able to use it well. It's interesting, I think a good parallel is how well someone can do, can use a search engine. So of the students that I supervise, a lot of them are doing surveys of startup companies and research in, in different organizations. And some students are absolutely great doing internet search, some people are absolutely not great. And being able to develop the skills for non-specialists, not computer science professionals, but non-specialists to use AI is a major educational challenge. We need to work on that one immediately. Uh, I think that one of, you know, like everything else, some job types will probably disappear, but probably not many. A few jobs will disappear. If you think about what jobs have already disappeared over the last 50 years, bookkeeper, clerk, you don't see people with that kind of job title anymore. And so some of those jobs will disappear. Some will change into niche positions. There are still people who are blacksmiths. But most of the blacksmiths in the world are artists now. They're not providing a basic service. So, um, you know, you'll see some of that. You'll see some new professions. When did data science become a profession? Not that long ago. And you'll see some things that are absolutely brand new. But for most people, what you'll see is a demand for them to use different tools to do what, what has always been done. So in advertising, okay, you'll get chat GPT or whatever the next version is to help you draft some sort of a presentation. That's fine, and it may make you much more productive. It may challenge you because um, you may need to have more work in order to keep employed full time, but it will require a person who understands the people-to-people -people communication to make sure that that's really working. It's not ready to be automated completely and probably won't ever really be completely automated. So I see a lot of people having to learn to use new tools, not just the specialists in those tool sets, but much more broadly in the workforce. Yeah, yeah, indeed. In fact, you mentioned something very important a little earlier, which is um, with all the automation, 
we still don't have the consciousness or the ethics built into machines, whether it's an artificial intelligence system, a generation system, and so on. Uh, I won't, we won't even speculate on when and how it will happen, but we know that there's long ways to go. So in the midst of that, how will the role of uh, being more human, how, is it a bigger role now? How do you see humans playing a role in using technology in wise ways? First of all, I think that as long as society is more or less run by the humans instead of by the robots, and I don't see the robots taking over, I think it will be responsibility is something that will be kind of more or less uniquely human. Now, the danger is here is this program that does everything for you, but we want you to take responsibility for it. That's kind of a tough, you know, kind of work situation. But in some ways, um, we've had something approaching that for a long time. But I think people can uniquely take responsibility uh, or accountability for the results of what they're doing, which means that instead of primary creation, in terms of coding or in terms of even some, you know, illustration and painting. I think we'll always have artists in society and always appreciate what humans create. But in terms of like industrial art or, you know, design, that kind of things, you may have a lot of that automated up front. And so the people's role will switch more like that of the editor in the newspaper instead of the writer. So the editor is responsible for the accuracy, also for you know the quality of the article. And I think that's going to hit most professions, um, which is one way in which I think that um, you know it's a natural limit on the artificial intelligence is, you know, how much will you trust it? And I think people will continue to want people to take responsibility and accountability. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting kind of, of problem that will mean that people will need to have new techniques for doing things, putting something through two different AI programs, changing the input string just a little bit to see what happens so you can get something to compare. You know, that sort of work hasn't been demanded yet, but I think it will increasingly be necessary in order for people to stay responsible for the output that's created. In fact, what you're saying rings true for the, the field that I've spent most of my time in, which is semiconductor design. You would actually use one system to design and another one to test or verify. Yeah. It's yeah. much easier in design of a mechanical, electrical system, but it's much harder when human feelings, human consciousness, um, right. you know, civil society is involved. Yeah. And, uh, I don't think, yeah, we are nowhere close to automating any of that. Uh, speaking of well, like, even, even in semiconductor design, how do you know that the code that's written will work before you try putting it into first silicon? And because how if it... you take the money to put it into, actually put it in a run and, and make silicon, you want it to be good and you want it to not mess up the manufacturing facility and you want it to have good potential yield. Exactly. So exactly. you have to solve these problems before you ever try to put it into first silicon. So you're going to exactly. have to look at whatever these programs are telling you about, you know, circuit design and how the transistors are arranged um, beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Verification, validation, safety, security, yeah. everything yeah. becomes more important. Exactly. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the... Subtle arts and humanities are also getting affected. 
to the extent that you can replicate things more, more easily. Uh, what I have in my background is actually an artist's version of Point Lobos created by Dali. So, okay. So you see, okay. as an artist, you have been a musician in the past and you have keen interest in the arts. Yeah. How do you see the role of artists changing with this kind of renditions, uh, some of which are completely copyright free? Artists have a very difficult innovation challenge, and they have for a long time. Uh, I think some of was it uh, Picasso who said he could paint like Raphael when he was six, and it <laughs> took him a lifetime to learn how to paint like a six-year-old. So, uh, you know, I think that they have the challenge of, one, trying to generate a unique new way of looking at the world. That's why art is a very individual kind of activity. And um, there's a lot of social things. If you just make another pretty picture, you know, or you just do another pretty piece of music, there's not a whole lot of respect for you in that artistic world. The artistic world is looking for innovators. And so that is a very big challenge. I think we get new tools. I think that we're only beginning to see the possibilities for how to give people more experiential art. And I think that um, it will be the people who learn how to use these new tools and who will challenge themselves under these very difficult constraints that society puts them under. You know, oh, you're, you're painting just like so-and-so did. Um, that's going to be difficult for a lot of the artists. Um, so I think that um, learning the new tools and continuing to look for a fresh way to reach people. Art and music communicate sometimes using words, but in many cases using other sensory input, light, sound, whatever. And that is a very important part of the human experience too. And humans, will always need art. And I think they will always want their art to, the best art will come from people. You know, why Why would you care to see robots playing soccer? I mean, that's nice, it's cool, it's great that they can do robots like that. Maybe they could even, you know, beat a human soccer team. But don't you really care about the people and people challenging themselves? So I kind of think that art, too, at least the very best. Now, you may have a lot of mass art that's kind of just auto automatically produced. But for the best art, we're going to look to people. Yes, indeed. And uh, you had mentioned about uh, how when there's any kind of innovation, you create this enormous amount of wealth. We are seeing that. And the last few years have seen enormous growth in Silicon Valley, right in our neighborhood, for instance. Um, and the real challenge is how this, how do we make the benefits of such changes inclusive? So what are your ideas on that? I've been to some of your conscious capitalism events. Is it actually happening? Or what will it take to make conscious choices in terms of making the benefits of change inclusive? Well, first of all, let's start with what problem you're trying to solve with your company. You know, if you're trying to solve a problem that improves climate change or, you know, it mitigates climate change at least, or it's something that improves the human condition in some way, then that's a good start. Uh, if you're doing something because it's attractive to people, let's say the next version of TikTok. You know, does that really help climate change? Probably not. Uh, so what do you do to make sure that you have some beneficial things 
because there will be some people who try to misuse it. But if you can do what Twitter did in the early days, it's largely forgotten now, but Twitter was the way that many people after the big Tohoku earthquake in 2011, when everything, all the communication networks were down, uh, cell phones were not allowed to be used because you had to keep the the you know the airspace open for uh, emergency system calls. People could use Twitter to let each other know they were okay, and that was a huge benefit back then. So, you know, if, you, if you're developing something that's just a new social media thing like TikTok, look for some way in which you can build in at least some education, you, making use of it or something else. So first, what problem do you solve? Second, make sure you incorporate something that will be broadly valuable in the, in, that's intrinsic to what the company does not just some add-on. And third, what kind of people do you hire? How do you bring in people? Do you bring in a diverse workforce? Do you bring in people who have disabilities? Not because you want good numbers, but because you want to use these people's understanding of the world. You know, if, if you can learn from people from different backgrounds, and that's the point of diversity. So I'm hoping that um, as companies are being formed, that they look at these three big things. What kind of problems? How can you make sure you're really incorporating something good? And, you know, who do you use? Um, what, how do you really build in diversity and equity in the way that you hire people and in the way that you treat your people. Speaking of which, diversity in education. You've been a musician, you've been a linguist, you've been a diplomat, you've been in foreign service, you've been a professor, you've also been an angel investor. Is there one particular thing you like more than others? And how did all these different roles or different avatars that Dr. Richard Dasher have help in making you who you are today? Um, this is kind of strange, but I think that every step in the path I've been on prepared me for the next step. So music really did teach me how to delay gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, you study an instrument for years before you really get to the point you want to play it in front of other people. And uh, I think that it also taught me a lot about kind of human society. In some ways, um, you know, a university is a mirror of an opera production where the professors are the singers out on stage, but you really need people behind the stage to run the lights and make the, the whole production happen. Um, music prepared me to go to work for the government because I was ready for this kind of, you know, multi-tier society. Government taught me a lot about politics. And I'm not talking about national politics. I'm talking about office politics. You know, um, some people say that all the important lessons in life were learned in kindergarten. And that's exactly the level you run into in a large organization like a government or like a big company or like a university. And the government work kind of prepared me to go back to the university. I understood the idea of different sources of funding, each of which have their own constraints and have their own kind of requirements. The university has taught me a lot of things, some of which are kind of cynical sounding. First of all, the mission of the university is very important. And the university is not very efficient. When you think about it, there's an awful lot of kind of wasted time and wasted resources, but maybe that's actually necessary in order to have young people with the time to learn how to do critical thinking, to examine things and see where the holes are. And, you know, from the bottom up kind of get frustrated. Um, 
that can be a value to the university too. The whole investing kind of thing, that keeps me honest. Because if I just sit back and I analyze entrepreneurship and I analyze, you know, new industry and new technology without putting a little bit of skin into the game, somehow it's not honest. And so to me, uh, the angel investment that I've done has led me to become a partner in a new venture capital firm. Uh, this is Global Hands-On Venture Capital, or GoVC for short, and we raised our first fund at the end of September. Uh, it's a little less than 50 million U.S. in the first fund, and we're still expanding the size of the first fund, but it's a real VC, and I'm one of five partners in the company, and uh, I, I'm learning a great deal about, you know, the kind of whole concept of not just a single person, but how can a group like that really work in a hands-on way to improve the success of the companies we invest in. Now, we're still early, but we've got term sheets out on three companies after looking at over 2,000 companies. And so, um, you know, I'm, this is still new for me, but I'm looking forward to learn more about it. Oh, that is exciting. I didn't know how serious your angel investing and now venture capital is. And uh, that's huge. It speaks volumes. So Richard, uh, having done a variety of things and especially now entrepreneurship and supporting entrepreneurs, do you have any advice for people in their careers, because this technological change, like many others, is going to change the way we do business. Is the way is going to change the way we lead our lives. What advice do you have for young people getting into careers and or people going through career transitions? What a great question! So, first of all, actually, I think I have two kind of sections to one answer to your question. The first section is people often ask me if they should become entrepreneurs or not. And I think that in the sense of really trying to start a company and really becoming an entrepreneur in the narrow sense, the most important thing is to have an idea that will not let you sleep if you do not try to bring it to the world. If you have an idea that's really worth your obsession for the next six or seven years, be an entrepreneur. You know, if you've got something that you just really think is going to work and you, you know, can't get away from it, now is the time I've got to do it. Okay, that's the time to become an entrepreneur. Now, the way you become an entrepreneur in that situation is you start with the people you really trust and talk to a few people about your idea and see before you quit your job or before you, you know, turn down a job offer, you certainly want to have a sense that, yes, this is worth my time. It's a strong enough probability of success. And some of these trusted people may have ideas to sort of uh, tweak your business idea. And that, that can be extremely valuable. So first of all, the decision of being an entrepreneur or not depends on the idea that you have, not your ability, not you know whether you can get it done. Starting a company takes more than one person anyway. So you can find the people who will do things that you're not comfortable doing. If you're really the brains of the operation, but you don't feel good getting out and communicating, finding the person who can be your voice is one of the first things to do uh, on the, the founder group. In general, most people feel so pressured by external things other people in their lives. So a lot of the college students that I talk to is their families uh, or, you know, how to be successful. 
I should do this in order to be successful, or I can't do this because I've got to be successful. And with all of that sort of external pressure, the one person's voice who kind of gets lost is you. And asking yourself what you really love doing. And don't just say, oh, I love selling or, oh, I love coming up with new ideas. Take it one step further and say, why do I love what I'm doing? What is it about creating something new that I really love? Is it the thought process until I've come up with it, that journey? Or is it seeing something new that didn't exist before? Find out as much as you can about what really motivates you, because you will be most successful in a situation where you're the most happy. Of course, everything's practical. There's a lot of mountaintops that people have to climb where they have to start wa walking in one direction and then change paths. Um, you may not have the opportunity to do what you really think you can do for the world your first job out of college, or if you are leaving a company, you may not have the perfect opportunity right up front. So you do have to be practical, but the real kind of compass that people need is a sense of their own kind of inner motivation, what they're, they feel good at, and you have to be careful because a lot of societies encourage us to be humble and say we're not very good at anything. Look at it a little deeper. Everybody has something they're good at, even if it's just, you know, getting out and experiencing the fresh air. There may be some things for you that would help you do that. I remember somebody who had been a very well-known human resources consultant, and he decided he wanted to be a landscape gardener because he wanted to be outside all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's fine. Find your path. My job at the university is to help my students find themselves and to help them maximize their potential for success by having a wide range of experiences, things that they can compare and see how it fits for them, talking to a lot of people, if you're still in school, talk to a lot of people out in the community. Get to know the local people who are in the bank or who are working in companies or people you may see walking down the street. That kind of getting to hear people tell their own stories is some of the most valuable kind of information you can get. And I think schools don't encourage it enough. I think that it's a mistake to have the university be an ivory tower. And so bringing in voices so that students can meet people from a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different kinds of professions is absolutely essential. Um, so that's it. First, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, decide whether you really have an idea that is worth your life for uh, you know, six and a half or seven years, probably 10. And the second thing is look and see what you really love doing. You know, uh, it, I've gone through this path kind of in an interesting way. I loved music, but what I found out that I loved about music was being in front of people and moving them. And so in a very different way, I'm in front of people a lot, and I'm moving them in a different way. So I've kind of come full circle. That is uh, something where I hope more people can feel that in their careers. He reminded me of one of my teachers who said, the only way you can truly find yourself is by first getting lost. If you're not lost, you can't find yourself. Have you what an absolutely that? great point. Yes. Have you gone through that experience and how oh, of course. <laughs> people get lost to find themselves? I, uh, you know, I'm getting to the point where I don't say this much anymore, but sometimes I still feel like saying, I'll let you know what I want to do when I grow up, when I figure it out. <laughs>
look for the next step. Sometimes that's the best thing. I've learned a lot just being at many of your forums. And I certainly hope that people, especially in the Bay Area, come to the US Asia Technology Management Center. The variety of topics is amazing. And or online, I think you have a lot of your programs now available online as well. So thank you for all the great work. And to people out there who are listening, uh, as, I, as you can see, I love to talk to a variety of people from a variety of different angles so that we can together understand the transformation that we are in, whether it's an industrial revolution, information revolution. We don't yet know what the implications will be, but it's a collective that will make all this happen. So please come forward. Let's have a conversation. Thanks again, Dr. Dasher. And I'm so grateful to you. And I'll be back listening to you again soon. Shankar, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on your program. It's a great thing you're doing, and I hope everyone will enjoy it and listen to many more of your programs.